Um, the following interview was conducted with Marisela Alvarado for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on June 23rd, 2008. The interviewer is Valerie Yaza, Diversity Fellow in the Purdue University Libraries. So welcome, Marisela. Thank you. Um, can we just start out with giving some background information for researchers? Sure. Um, just talk about um, where you grew up, your parents, siblings, early life, oh, and give your name. As well. Okay. So. My name is Maricela Alvarado. Um, do you want me to spell it too? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Um, I am actually from Washington State. I was born in Prosser, Washington, a small agricultural town. It's still a small agricultural town. And I grew up in um, Moses Lake, Washington, which is also an ag town. And my parents are still in Moses Lake. And so, uh, but my parents are from Mexico. So um, they grew up migrating and finally settled in Washington and they both went to Washington State University for a, a program called HEP which is high school equivalency program that's a federally funded program and it actually still exists at Washington State I think it's like 37 38 years old now and um, I ended up going to Washington State for my undergrad and I sort of took the long way around I went to community college first and worked full-time and worked at banks and um, I worked for city government and before I finally went to get finish my BA at um, at Washington State University and I got my I got two bachelor's degrees in English and Spanish and uh, while I was there I went to Costa Rica to live and do study abroad and then I did um, uh, I ended up graduating and of course I got a job I actually was accepted to grad school at Washington State but I decided to go to a job offer that I had in Florida so to, to move 3,000 miles away and I worked at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University for a year and then uh, went to grad school at University of Florida and had some professional things in and out after grad school and then finally settled here okay. at Purdue. Yeah. And your master's was in? Education. Education. Yeah. Okay. Education. Um, talk about your history with Purdue. Okay, <laughs> my history with Purdue. I just finished my uh, fourth year anniversary, or started my fourth year anniversary. I'm in my fifth year now, and so um, before I came here, the, the center was here for about a year uh, when I really wasn't looking for a job, but I looked in the Chronicle. I, I was always looking to see what was out there, and um, I saw the job, and it was, a, it was an interesting thing because Purdue had already always been in I guess in my career in some respect because when I was at Embry-Riddle Purdue was a competitor for us and I was in admissions there so Purdue was always one of the bigger competitors for for flight students and, and engineering students and then I worked for the College of Engineering at University of Florida and so Purdue was also there too and so it was interesting that I saw that and I really still wasn't looking for a job but I thought I'd inquire to see a little bit more about the position when I found out I would, you know, the director would be the first director, it's a brand new center. I was definitely piqued my interest because then I thought it would be more something I create as opposed to stepping into somebody else's shoes and, and trying to fill those shoes. And so um, I did look at it as an opportunity and then I had a phone interview. I had, um, I was probably in October of 2003 mm -hmm. and and then after the phone interview, they actually called me for an on-campus interview, and I did an on-campus interview. And it, I think it was on campus that I finally started thinking, uh, maybe I could, you know, work here because I really loved Florida, and I still love Florida. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was when I was really definitely looking at uh, Purdue a little more seriously because everybody was saying, oh, the new president, he's doing great things, and it's a great time to come, and everybody seemed so sincere about that, and so. Mm -hmm. Um, I definitely started looking into it a little bit more and uh, then Sally Mason called me and, and uh, she was the provost at the time and she asked me to come back on campus and for what I thought was the second interview but come to find out it was the actual offer and so um, I was surprised and, and excited at the same time but it was definitely a big decision to make and I'm, um, I started in March in 2004 and so uh, now that I've had four years here, I definitely, you know, I definitely think it was a, a good decision, and mm -hmm. um, I'm glad I'm, you know, was able to be part of it. And so, so you came in 11 months after the opening of the building. Yeah, I guess it was, it was about 11 months because it opened in April. April of yeah. 2003. Okay. 
Yep. And that was during the time you came in when President Jiski. Yeah, there. it kept calling him new, but he was actually here for a few years. So it was <laughs> interesting that they kept calling him new. But I guess because the previous president had been here for so long that they did um, see him as, as a new and fresh uh, thing happening at Purdue. So mm -hmm. that was exciting. Okay. And you could feel that in the interviews. You could feel everybody's kind of excitement and mm -hmm. that it was genuine. Um, when you came from Florida, were you working in admissions? Or? No, I was actually working uh, the College of Engineering and I was doing first year programs primarily for multicultural students. Okay. But um, I did start transitioning when I, when I was leaving. I was actually transitioning into uh, doing first year program for the whole uh, incoming class for the College of Engineering, which was a pretty large class. And um, I, did, I definitely liked my job there. It was interesting being in an engineering college when I wasn't an engineer <laughs> and so um, I found those students to definitely be uh, challenging in some ways but mm -hmm. um, definitely worth making the effort of, of doing some support programs to help them get through a rig rigorous uh, collegiate career so mm -hmm. I really enjoyed my time there. I read an article where you had encouraged your students to stay at Purdue who was thinking about transferring, is that right? Yeah, so there was coming? a student, um, I don't remember the exact situation, do you remember if they were, <laughs> they were transferring from transferring Florida to Purdue, right? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it was, it was a weird thing happening and it, I was sort of stuck, felt stuck in two different places, but at the time I, I still felt my heart was at Florida because... Uh, I knew Florida and I graduated from Florida too. So, but I can understand, especially being at Embry Riddle, when I was at Embry Riddle, um, the attraction to Purdue in terms of what it can offer with the sciences and technology and engineering and all of that, that there's a lot behind the name mm -hmm. and knowing that it's a world class university. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you get to meet Jesse Snazza? on your first interview here? Though. I did. I met her during, not in the phone interview, but on the on-campus interview, she took me around to just see the area and, and look at uh, where I might live. And so luckily it was a nice day out and <laughs> it wasn't winter time yet. So oh, that's how they get you. Yeah, yeah, that's how they get you is before the winter starts to hit. So yeah, so I did get to meet her. Um, let's see. What kind of challenges did you face as a director when you first got here? Um, well, I knew, I think, in the interview that there were a lot of expectations of this position um, and really not a clear expectation at the same time. So there were, um, I think, people wanted me to be a recruiter, uh, community outreach, do community outreach to raise money and write for grants. Mm -hmm. and. Um, it was definitely a job that had a lot, I knew had a lot of hats to wear, I guess, and a lot of roles to play. And so uh, I knew I was going to have a lot of challenges. And I think that the hardest thing was coming in and being confronted with it on a daily basis of what people expect of you mm -hmm. and what you can and can't fulfill and, and really quickly finding out that with lack of resources, it's really hard to fulfill all those mm -hmm. expectations that everyone had at the time and probably still have to a certain extent of what the director should do, how um, people, if they were the director, what would they do and how mm -hmm. would they run the center. Uh, it certainly was definitely hard to do and you kind of have to build a thick skin in terms of criticism and um, unfil unfulfilled expectations, I guess. Mm -hmm. and so. I think that was the toughest part and, and the other thing would be uh, getting the students engaged in, continue to be engaged because I think they were uh, very engaged before the center existed and in order to create the center and then once the center was here in order to staff the center, however it seemed like once I got here they, it was almost a sigh of relief which I can understand but at the same time it was um, sort of a letting go and mm -hmm. and at this so at the same time I had to keep them engaged and pull them back in so that they remained involved mm -hmm. and maybe not to that extent that they were before but definitely right. to remain involved yeah okay. 
who were the main people who were involved before you got here? I mean, there was Jesse Snazza, and then there were some students. Yeah, Jesse was actually hired um, not long after the center was opened, and they sort of just did a search um, through the HR directory of people who had applied for positions that might fit that category. So Jesse wasn't really involved in the initial part of it, but she definitely mm -hmm. was there to build on you know, the building and what resources were within the building and what I would need when I would arrive, mm -hmm. um, or the director, whoever that would be. And so um, prior to that, I know Hansel Monroy was one of the key alumni that wrote the letters in terms of writing letters to pro the provost, the administration, mm -hmm. in order to get a center. And my understanding is that there was very little resistance and it was really just a matter of time that this was gonna happen, it was just, um, somebody had to make that request in a, in a way and so mm -hmm. I know he and the Latino Student Union I want to say um, JD LeBoy uh, who graduated the year I ended up coming and a few others I know Yasmin Fuentes was here at the time Alfredo Aspurua was here um, I'm sure there's people I'm missing cause, just because mm -hmm. they left before I came but when I got here definitely Yasmin Fuentes Michael Carrillo, J.D. Lavoy. Um, I'd have to go back and look at more mm -hmm. names, but those are the three that sort of pop into my head mm -hmm. right away. Uh, there's um, Is there Jose. a lot of um, faculty involvement also? Or? Um, I, that, that too remains somewhat controversial, I guess, of who started the LCC. I know that there were, at the time, um, there were rumors or things that had been said that the faculty approached administration and I think that my understanding or my clear understanding is that the students had some advice from the faculty and mm -hmm. uh, Tony Mungia was very instrumental in that. She was the advisor to the Latino Student Union at the time and so she I think was a big help with that. Um, Joel Sarate was another person I think that was instrumental Angelica Duran definitely had some faculty push in that regard. She was also on the search committee for the director search. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that they were involved, but I think that if people were to ask me who actually did it um, and, and really made that push, I would say the students did. And mm -hmm. um, during the whole time I interviewed, that was what was re relayed to me. Mm -hmm. It was that the, it was really a push from the students. Um, when you came in, was the LCC under the provost's office? Yes, it's always been under the provost okay. office, and um, which is actually an odd place for it to be. Uh, I've worked at other cultural centers uh, in, at Washington State and then at University of Florida as well, where they were placed under sort of a student services area. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's a, an important place for it to be because it reduces some of the layers of bureaucracy and and. Uh, sense of importance, I guess, and so that way we do feel that we're part of the main university mission and that we're not sort of uh, just buried under, under, you know, a lot of layers of, of, of reporting structure, I guess, or organizational structure, and right. so it does put us in a position of priority. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Definitely. <laughs> I wouldn't change it, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, the BCC used to be under Res, Res Life. Life. Yeah. Okay. But they're yeah. now under the provost's office. Right, and I, I'm not sure what their history is. I know that they go 30 plus years back, and so I think they were only under Res Life because of the history. Mm -hmm. And so before uh, President Juski left, he, did, he wanted the centers to both be under one auspice. And it, 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 I, I think it was to their benefit. I don't know what Renee would say, but um, <laughs> I think it was definitely to their benefit and to ours to get us all under one. Um, you know, one umbrella because now we work together a lot better with the Native American Educational Cultural Center coming on board. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like we're more co uh, cohesive as a unit and we understand sort of our roles with the provost a little bit better and in terms of the academic area and how to really focus our mission that way. And, mm -hmm. and it does also provide a lot of support amongst ourselves in, in terms of finding ourselves. Before it seemed like we we're a little isolated and um, decentralized in terms of how we did things and now I, I do feel 
we still have work to do, but I still I feel like mm -hmm. we're a lot more uh, cohesive in that way, and that we're centralizing our efforts a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So, right. appreciate that. <clears throat> the same year you came, you had your first annual retreat for the Latino Leadership. Yeah, Club. the Latino Leadership Retreat we we created, and it was actually a retreat that I started. Um, because I had had experiences at other universities in doing retreats, whether I was a participant or I actually helped facilitate. And so I felt like, again, you know, going back to that student engagement, really keeping them involved with the center and also getting them to work together. Because when I arrived, there were about six or seven Latino-based organiz student organizations. And so those six or seven, and why I say six or seven is because we just didn't know who was active, who wasn't active, and, and that had to sort of play out over time in figuring out who we can get engaged. And so we, we decided to put together sort of an all-day retreat for us to do some team building, getting to know each other, because what we noticed the students were doing was they were planning programs on top of each other. They were competing sort of for the same audience. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other thing is that we didn't know all of them. We really only knew the Latino Student Union, a few members from the Hispanic Business Student Association. We knew there was a Society for Hispanic Professional Engineers, but we weren't really engaged with them. So this was an opportunity for us to be a little bit more engaged with those organizations. And it really was a great success. And we added a sort of incentive component to it where, you know, for students who, or for student organizations that brought the most members, they would get um, a financial reward. And we provided three, top three rewards for doing that. And some companies actually backed us in being able to provide those awards and support the program. And so now, since then, we've had um, a retreat every semester, and it's always a full day retreat. We have sort of shifted to really trying to target freshmen into getting involved. So the fall retreat tends to be a few more students than usually the spring retreat because we heavily, heavily target freshmen. And the reason we do that is because we want them to be engaged right away. We want them to learn about our services. We want them to learn about the different student organizations that they can be involved with and to see what is um, what fits them best because I think that um, in one day, I mean, you'll, it'll be hard to get that experience all in one day to see mm -hmm. which organization would fit them best because we now have 15 Latino-based organizations and so we've more than doubled and, and uh, confident that we'll only grow from there. So mm -hmm. that's sort of the history of the retreat and we still continue to do it. So, okay. yeah. I, I guess what were some of the big things you were trying to accomplish because one of them was the Latino leadership retreat. The conference? Um, Are you talking about the Indiana Latino Leadership Conference? Uh, no, I mean when you first got here to yeah. Purdue, I mean that was one of your big ideas. Yeah, yeah, that was started. one of them. Mm -hmm. um, Embajadores? Embajadores was yeah. the other one. Was another one? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. And I was just going to say Embajadores was the other one because for a similar reason we really needed, I was only a staff, we only had a staff of two at the time, and it was just Jesse and I. Um, and then we had about two work study students, and so, and then we were way in the outskirts of campus, unlike this location that we have. Now we were in the old, uh, well, it's the old LCC, it's the new Native American Educational Cultural Center now, and so in South Campus Courts. And so we really needed to engage students in, in terms of helping us program and helping us uh, do some of the things that they expected me to do in the interview that they asked about recruitment retention, you know, mm -hmm. community outreach, um, leadership things, and, and so the list fundraising. And so we really looked to the embajadores to use that, those efforts as not just a benefit to us, but also to benefit them in terms of service learning types of activities where they would learn while they, um, while they were serving at the same time. And so it was more of an active uh, learning environment. So we hope that we, that's what we provide and we still continue to do that. And it's evolved into, again, we started around seven to 10 students, You know, some really engaged, some not. Mm -hmm. And um, by the time, by well, actually this year, we've had our highest participation and we've had 35 students participate. And now we have five different committees that are dedicated to community outreach. We have a student newsletter now. Um, we have health and rec, culture and art, 
and social justice. And so those are the five different committees and they they act on a very democratic level. There is no hierarchy. So unlike the student organizations, there isn't a president, there isn't a vice president. Everyone has sort of a role, mm -hmm. um, whether it's part of a committee or you know they actually work within you know technology aspects or something like that. They definitely have uh, different roles and responsibilities. And so, and we do evaluations on the program, and uh, we get a lot of great feedback from the students. And we always change according to what they want. So th it is it is an organization that we definitely get a lot from, but we hope that we're we're providing them as well. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, your motto: Everyone is welcome. Yeah. Is that one that you came up with. You I didn't come up with it actually. I can't take the credit for that. I'm not, you know, I don't know if Jesse said anything of who came up with it. No, she, didn't she didn't know either. No. Yeah, I'm not sure who came up with that. It was sort of here when I got here. I thought it was great though and and uh, cuz we do have to explain on a on a pretty regular basis that the center is not just for Latino students. It's not for Latino faculty staff. It's for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and we we always include community in that respect because we do get a lot of community uh, phone calls and visits and, and just curiosity or needs, people who need resources. So we definitely encourage faculty, staff, all students to use the services that we provide and get involved in whatever organizations and mm -hmm. opportunities that we have as well. So that, I think it fits perfect actually. So whoever thought of it is great. So. <laughs> So I think looking at the history of the Cultural Center, it seems like it was a lot of student engagement at first, and mm -hmm. now it's kind of the students engaging the community. Because um, you have a lot of community programs going on, like your Dia de los Muertos, um, that involve the students mm -hmm. and the community. Yeah, I guess it is sort of, I didn't look at it that way, but it, I guess it is sort of transforming um, in some respects that way. And in a way, I wish we could do more. Um, but yeah, we have a mentor program that is connected to Embajadores as well with the Community Outreach Committee. And um, that program has, has grown just within the two years that it, of its existence. And um, it could definitely grow more, but we need more resources. And so we're still uh, having growing pains in that respect that we need more resources to be able to adequately provide those types of resources to um, people within the community and students in particular because the mentor program works with high school students at Jefferson High School right now mm -hmm. but we could certainly extend it to McCutcheon to Harrison High School but Jefferson we chose Jefferson particularly because it has the highest concentration of Latino students in the county which, at, which is at 17 percent right now and so and there are issues um, at the high school in terms of dropout rates and um, just finishing high school, you know, there or anywhere else. And so the, our effort was really to show those high school students that Purdue is accessible to them. And it, yeah, it is, it's in their backyard and it is accessible. So we just thought that it was interesting that there weren't things already sort of happening in that respect, specifically targeting those students because they definitely need the support. Mm -hmm. um, Javier Magallanes was the ESL intake person, he could probably better describe exactly what his title was, but um, he was the person that we first worked with at Jefferson High School, and he approached us, and, and we, were, we were already taking students um, once a year from Jefferson High School to the Latino Leadership Conference in Bloomington, um, and we would get feedback from them here and there, but we didn't feel we were ready to really start a mentor program, but when, when Javier sort of surfaced, we felt like okay, this might be something we could do because we had somebody at Jeff to be able to um, be our contact person there and the coordinator on that side because it is across the river. That river really does unfortunately divide a lot of things that we do um, and, a, and it's a barrier you know, for some people to go across. And so on both sides, I think, even our students have hard times sometimes crossing over to the other side as well. So um, that that has evolved and I think when we do Dia de los Muertos and Dia de la Familia, those sort of tie into uh, really nicely into the mentor program or the mentor program ties into those. I'm not sure which one goes first. And so the, the mentor program though is something that we're really proud of right now and it's something that we're definitely focusing on growing and, and we're 
Um, not sure in what way it's going to grow, and, and we've already gotten requests from middle schools that want a similar program that focuses. Right now, what we're focusing on, which I didn't mention earlier, is that we're focusing on college access. And so what is it like to apply for college? What do you need to apply for college? Um, how should you prepare? But we're finding that by high school, we're a little late. And right. so that we might need to go to the middle schools. And we are getting a request right now from the middle schools to, to do that. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping we can go in that direction. But resources are, is always a challenge. Mm -hmm. so. Is that overlapping any other programs on campus as far as the mentoring aspect? Or? Um, not that I can think of. I know 21st Century Scholars definitely does some similar things with students at, at Jefferson High School. And they do have um, a coordinator that works with them as well. And so I don't think we overlap. I, I, I think that, you know, there might be anecdotal things that mm -hmm. some departments might do, but unfortunately there isn't something that's very consistent. And I can't even say that we're super consistent. I mean, we are starting to get there, but we are um, uh, definitely going through some growing pains with that. So, yeah. yeah. That sounds wonderful. Though. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. I hope so. <laughs> There's definitely a need out there, so. <laughs> um, along with retention and recruitment, it, it's really important for the students, mm -hmm. but I think it's also as important with faculty and staff. Right. Um, I guess, do you know when the creation of La Fossa had started? Um, my, my, just asking questions and um, we, we found out that I think La Fossa had started I want to say around 2001, uh, and I think it, again it depends on who you ask, and and sometimes, you know, what we hear too it goes with the student organizations is that things have been started and then they disappear for a while and then they resurface. So it could be that it started back in 1970, disappeared and came back, but um, my my understanding is that it started as sort of an email list mm -hmm. of just sort of an information thing and. It, it developed into a committee, and I think Angelica Duran, around 2002, 2003, I don't know what year exactly, she started to take a little bit more leadership on that. Um, and still, even with that, I think it was still mainly in a listserv, and every once in a while they would meet. And then, let's see the history, and then when I got here, uh, we started, or Angelica had wanted to do what's, what they call First Fridays, and so first Friday of every semester they sort of have a gathering for new faculty and mm -hmm. staff and uh, a meet and greet kind of thing, and give inf we give information on sort of the Latino resource guide that we have on information mm -hmm. within the community, and we do try to uh, help with recruitment. So if any departments are trying to recruit Latino faculty or staff, a lot of times they'll set up appointments with us to tour the center or meet with me um, to sort of talk about the Latino community here and we provide them with a ton of resources to help them if they do choose to come or they get selected to come to Purdue that um, they have the resources before they get here. Okay. And so we do assist with that. But as far as La Fasa, we work really closely with them and I would say, gosh I wish I knew the year exactly, but I think it was 2005. Um, probably early 2005 where Kimber Nicoletti ended up taking over leadership of La Fasa and she's done a great job where there's a, a lot more consistent meetings I think kind of like the LCC there's you know they've had their growing pains and um, now they're they're definitely much more established than when I even first started and and I hope that it's also because of the collaboration and the existence of the LCC. I think mm -hmm. that the growth of the Latino student organizations from 7 to 15 um, is because of the LCC's existence mm -hmm. and, and just that there's a central hub sort of for information and for services and for meeting space and things like that. I think that helps a lot. Yeah. yeah. Okay, now we're going to stop the tape real quick. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about the difference between, I guess, do you remember the move from the old center? Yeah, the I do. Um, we were actually, around that time, we were looking at, um, I was actually working for Peggy Rowe, Dr. Rowe, in the provost office, and she, you know, every time we met, I always, always 
explaining how difficult it was to be out at that location in terms of trying to do tours and being compared to the Black Cultural Center. That was really, really challenging uh, in terms of explaining, especially the recruitment aspect of explaining to uh, possible, you know, prospective students on why is the BCC so big and made specifically to be a BCC and then the LCC is a small, tiny space. And so we always use that as a way to say, well, we're new, the BCC is, you know, 30 years old and it's a great time to come. Sort of what they did for me, you know, <laughs> when they were recruiting me because, um, we were telling students this is something that you can create from scratch it's, it'll be yours and and um, you know you can kind of grow with it and so and be part of history so to speak and mm -hmm. so um, we did use it to our advantage not to say that it always worked but we tried to and so um, we could never do programs on site very rarely could we do programs on site and so uh, Peggy, you know, told me she was going to start looking and see if there was anything else more centralized that we could get into. I, I was actually more concerned with location than I was with size. Mm -hmm. Certainly the size would have been great, but I was really more concerned with location. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> she found, a, she found a, a place over on Hayes Street, which is across university, um, or no, not university, across Northwestern be sort of behind the visitor center area and um, beautiful house very similar to this this location mm -hmm. but what I didn't like was that it was across Northwestern and it had that sort of other side of the tracks feel it still really wasn't mm -hmm. in the main thoroughfare of campus and, and um, so I took a risk and I said no that we would wait for something better um, I took a big risk because it was it was hard to say no to at the time but I thought we'll go ahead and wait and 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 Peggy was great and she just said if that's what your heart is telling you you know don't don't take it because you feel pressured to to get something different or a bigger space do what you feel like you need to do and so I was supported in that and and felt lucky that she was behind me and she did you know she did actively look and so she found this through the Purdue Research Foundation and and so we came and toured the house to see, you know, what do we want? We love the location, um, and of course, as soon as we came in, I mean, it was it was beautiful. And so, mm -hmm. and and I didn't realize this at the time, but when you go into the BCC library, you'll see a picture of the old BCC before they got the new building, and it looks, if you look at the front of the house, it looks almost exactly like this house. So it was mm -hmm. very interesting because I didn't I never knew that until after we had already moved in and I had looked at that picture and it was it's it looks almost exactly like that old house so mm -hmm. we're definitely following into the BCC's footsteps in that respect and so and it's much more centralized we've seen a huge increase in visitor traffic mm -hmm. um, we're on the main you know one of the main streets of the campus which helps a lot we're right in between the residence halls and the academic units um, so the move actually happened quite quick. I think I looked at, we looked at 600 North Russell, this location, we looked at early fall of 2005, I think. What year are we in? Yeah, 2005. And we moved in in March of 2006. And so, so we've been here two years now. And mm -hmm. um, we were very lucky at the time because it was a residence before we moved in and so we had to do a lot of conversions and and uh, we were very lucky that we got support from ITAP to establish an, uh, an actual ITAP lab which we didn't have at the old location. They also uh, wired the building to be wireless, completely wireless. Uh, we're also connected to the central um, campus phone systems to um, the networking systems in terms of computers and things like that which we didn't have and it was definitely a large expensive task and we know that uh, we were lucky that the university and the provost office in particular stepped up and, and really saw that it was it was an it was a investment mm -hmm. for for the building and for us and so um, the other thing that we got was the ADA access for the first floor. We wish we had it to the second floor, but we were just happy to have ADA access at all. And so that was some of the conversion that happened um, when we moved into the building. And 
um, we're, we love where we are. Certainly, we can always use more space, but mm -hmm. even the BCC, they can't do all of their programming there, and they usually do most of their programming off-site. But we're now just down the street from the BCC. We're right across the street from the International Center, um, close to the residence halls, and, and it's just it's so, so much better for us. I think the only complaint we have now is parking, so which we definitely had to sacrifice. <laughs> Everybody's, yeah, everybody complains about the parking, which I wish I, wish I could fix, but we had to sacrifice something. <laughs> You're close to the dining center. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, at least if there's food around, you know, so uh -huh. something. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about our change in president to... President Cordova. Yeah, I think um, President Cordova is definitely on making history on two fronts, where she's the first Latina and she's the first female president of Purdue. Um, and then, but on the second hand, I, I feel like it might be uh, one of those things, kind of like what the students did when you know a director was hired, where people just kind of throw up their hands. Diversity done, you know, check. We've got that. I don't think that's happened, but I do think people automatically assume that that's happening. And so um, I think we still have a lot of work to do, and I think she's committed to that. And I think coming from California, she comes with some good experience to understand some of the issues with first generation, second generation, third generation um, students, immigrant students in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, but we certainly have a diverse pool of students, of Latino students. We have about a thousand domestic Latino students, which of course includes Puerto Rico, and then we have about 350 international students from all over Latin America, including Spain. Mm -hmm. And so, and that, it's about 2.5% of the, the student population. It hasn't changed, that percentage hasn't changed, but I'm hoping that kind of like with Jiski's presidency, um, some of the shift Jiski, I think, started a lot of the diversity efforts on campus, and I think that President Cordova will maintain that and hopefully excel beyond, you know, in terms of recruitment mm -hmm. and really move towards the retention. And she's talking a lot about student services, and and so um, so I think that we're we will we'll be moving in that direction with her presidency. But one of the things that I think is great about having her is that we have. You know, she, she came and spoke for our uh, open house last year, and there was a, a little boy that came up to her afterwards and asked her for her autograph. And, and so I just thought that was sweet because it's, it's a young Latino boy that's just seen, you know, someone in a, in a position like that, and, and especially as a former chief, you know, NASA chief scientist, mm -hmm. and with all of the accolades she has behind her, I thought that was just great to see. And, and sometimes you don't realize how important just that picture is so mm -hmm. I think that definitely will make a difference mm -hmm. for both females and Latinos yeah. in particular yeah, yeah. Um, I guess to talk more about your programs that you have at the LCC um, one of them that you just had in May was the yeah human immigration, immigration. Humanigration um, is a program that we created because of so many presentations and questions on immigration, immigration in the media in the past few years. Um, this election this year definitely impacts a lot of what uh, might happen with immigration reform and things like that. And so Humanigration is um, a partnership with a, a, an organization, a nonprofit organization called Borderlinks that's based in Tucson. It's actually a binational organization based in both Tucson, Arizona, and Nogales, Mexico. And so um, we decided to call the program and sort of you know, own the program a little bit more because we felt like we were doing a lot of the orientation. We definitely inform Borderlinks on how we want the trip to look like Mm -hmm. um, and so the trip is a, a five-day trip and, and it straddles both sides of the border and so our goal with this trip was to take students, faculty, staff, community members and alumni and so this was the first year that we did it. We did it in May and our intention was actually to do it during spring break but unfortunately Borderlinks was full at the time and so we, we, took, we took the May date to see how could we work with that. and. Um, we did. We ended up taking 13 people, and six of those were students. 
two of those were alumni. Uh, we had two, three community members, and the rest were, fa were staff, LCC staff. And so um, I think we fulfilled our goal, you know, and we did have a staff member on there. We were hoping for a faculty member, but we weren't able to get a faculty this year. Mm -hmm. um, and so our goal with the program really was to create sort of ambassadors. Um, not embajadores, but ambassadors mm -hmm. in terms of immigration and, and looking at educating more people. And so by taking this sort of experiential learning aspect, it was, it was one of those experiences, or it's intended to be an experience that um, you see, feel, smell, touch, taste. You can, you can really understand the process of immigration in a more human level. And that's why we decided to title it Human Integration because we felt like it's not a media, you know, regurgitation of what's going on. It's sort of something that you can sort of decide for yourself on how you feel about um, what's happening with immigration in terms of, especially Mexican immigration, because that's what's really highlighted in the media. Of course, there's all kinds of immigration, mm -hmm. but Mexican immigration in particular and what it what it looks like up front and personal because and the reason why we chose Borderlinks because Borderlinks does focus on um, the Sonoran Desert in particular and the Sonoran Desert there's uh, many deaths and it's hard to really calculate how many deaths a year but it's estimated to be about 200 deaths a year in the Sonoran Desert because of immigrant crossings and human trafficking and so you know we we go to explore why is that happening um, and so we do look at the political aspects, the economic aspect, health aspect. Um, and so uh, during that visit, we, we get to do some court hearings. We actually get to go to an immigrant liftoff point in Mexico where uh, migrants meet their, their guides, better word for human traffickers, but um, they meet their guides to cross the desert and we get to meet them and actually talk to them on why are they crossing, how many times have they crossed, and, and, um, and really you know, better understand that. We got to go visit this year a center for repatriated minors where they, they were minors who were deported, or you know, caught at the border and they were deported, but yet they were underage and so they have to be repatriated into Mexico and going back to their homes or their families. So they're in a, sort of in a, in, a, in a camp, a detention kind of camp on the Mexican side of the border. And we got to visit with those kids and, and ask them, you know, how did they cross? Why did they do it? Are they gonna try it again? And mm -hmm. surprisingly, they were very honest. And, and um, it, so, you know, it was, it's, it's sad though at the same time and so, we found this year that it was definitely beneficial for us to do the orientation and to sort of create our own mm -hmm. aspect of the human integration and um, go somewhere after we get back. Like, what are we going to do when we get back? And, and a lot of the conversation um, was really led by the participants as opposed to us, hey, you know, you guys are going to do this and you guys are going to do that. They really kind of took charge and, and um, it really showed us that the program was that powerful that it incited self sort of motivation to to do something as opposed to having it so mm -hmm. structured and organized that if we give you this money to go then you know you have to do this this and this they, they want to do these things because of the program and so we hope that we're going to continue that um, that program we definitely have scheduled for next year and so we'll see you know depending on how long the immigration topics in the media and how long borderlings keeps doing this mm -hmm. and whether or not we'll you know how long we'll do it for but i think that this gives us a good idea for and a good footprint for the future to do some more experiential learning activities where mm -hmm. we actually get to go see and do and feel and hear and touch and and all that and yeah. so we we don't have to stop there we can you know look at puerto rico we can look at doing some service in Ecuador, Nicaragua, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I think it gives us a good foundation for looking at, you know, different aspects of Latin America and what we can do to go there as opposed to just bringing it here and, and having more people benefit from it and the community benefit from it. Mm -hmm. So was there a limit on the number of people who could go? Or? Yeah, unfortunately there was. Money-wise, there was, and then um, because we, we were only looking at filling one van, so it was a 15-passenger van, and so oh that was the limitation, and 
we're already getting a ton of requests for next year and so we're having to change the process because we sort of did a nominations this year and we nominated the students we nominated you know faculty staff and and community uh, members and so this next year we're I think we're going to do applications just because we have so much interest and we do want a lot of people to go but the cost is just preventing us and I think would prevent the participants as well and we're mm -hmm. the one thing that we do aim to do is make it more affordable for students in particular and so one of the things that with Embajadores that we notice is that we have a lot of Latino students and a lot of them are second generation and so their parents were immigrants but they know nothing about what their parents had to go through to get to the U.S. Um, and so we really want those students who, who are active, who are leaders in our programs that um, they get the first shot to go because they, we think that they deserve it and they definitely um, need to sort of see that. I think even myself, I'm second generation, to see that, you know, what your parents have to sacrifice to cross the border, that it's not something taken lightly and it's not something that um, people really want to do. You know, I always tell people, do you think people really want to move from Cancun, you know, with, you know, palm trees and all of that to Indiana? Why, you know, you only work, you come here for work, and so you don't come here because you just want to exploit the system and things like that. You come here to work, there's a, there's a reason people come, and so I think that for students in particular, it gives them, especially Latino students in particular, it gives them a better idea of where, how much their families probably had to sacrifice to come to the U.S., and probably still do to a certain extent. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds really great. Yeah. Do you have any other programs that you want to? About. Um, just some you know new things that are coming up that we have um, or we're affiliated with the one good thing about Purdue is that we we do have a lot of good connections across departments and colleges and whatnot one of the things that we've been working on with Department of Communications and they've definitely taken the lead and we've given, given them some resources to um, produce a Spanish language program called Fast Track de Informa. It's basically a, a Spanish version of Fast Track, which is a, a news program that comes on once a week. It's connected with a comm class. So students produce it, film it, report. They do, they do all aspects of production. And so that will be airing in the fall. And we're proud that we were, we were part of that. And we hope to see it move forward and succeed. And we're glad that other departments are taking sort of um, their own initiatives and mm -hmm. that's that's a good example of that and we're happy to, to sort of work with those types of programs. The other thing is we're formalizing our book collection this summer and we're excited for that to grow and have more electronic resources. Uh, one of the things that was interesting when I came here is that there's no there wasn't a Latino studies program at the time and mm -hmm. there won't be actually until the fall so the fall the Latino studies minor will be in effect and then we also don't have a formal Latin American book collection and so that was something that um, other Big Ten schools do have and, and Purdue is lacking and so we have sort of made up for some of that and we hope that we can um, you know provide more media resources and, and um, uh, any kinds of resources that, that students feel that would enhance their learning in terms of Latin America mm -hmm. and um, if we can you know sort of enhance or you know work together with liberal arts and, and better connecting with a Latino studies program that would be great too and so that is our hope is to be more connected to the different departments that have those different efforts going on so I'm trying to think if there's anything else I feel like I'm missing a ton of stuff one thing with the president is the strategic plan we are looking at moving more towards a um, little bit less in terms of the programming and more on the academic aspects of really looking at the retention factor. Since the president is very focused on um, service to the students and making sure that they're academically prepared and supported, I think we're gonna shift a little bit more to the academic arena in that respect for our current students. And then if we can, if we are able to get some of the resources, definitely expand some on the community, um, community outreach aspects Mm -hmm. But in, tor in, in terms of pipelining them, 
um, community, especially students, into higher education. Whether they come to Purdue or not, it doesn't matter, as long mm -hmm. as they go to college. That's really what we want to kind of shift to. And not to say we won't do, you know, some cultural programs. We will do cultural programs. It probably just wouldn't, it probably will just be a little bit different focus um, mm -hmm. in the future. So that's kind of what I see. And I'm sure there's things I'm missing, <laughs> but I just can't think of them right now. So you so. just celebrated uh, the LCC had its fifth year yeah, anniversary this yeah. year. What do you see in the next, I guess, couple of years as far as the future for the LCC? Um, do you see another moving? Like, I don't see it that, or? to be honest, I don't see it that soon. I see, um, kind of like I said just earlier, is I see a restructuring in terms of what our, what our mission will be enhancing what the provost office does, enhancing what the strategic plan that the president's putting into effect. So I see us shifting in that respect. And so um, as far as location, I don't really see that too much. Um, I definitely see a lot more alumni involvement and we're already starting to see that a little bit more. We do have a Purdue Latino alumni organization and it's been in, this, in effect for, gosh, four years now and so um, I, I see the leadership in that definitely growing and of course they're going through their growing pains too but um, I see them being much more involved and I think that they will be the ones to determine uh, when and how and, and you know if we'll get a new cultural center similar to the Black Cultural Center and so mm -hmm. I hope it happens a lot faster than the way it did for the Black Cultural Center but I don't see that, unfortunately, in the near future. Mm -hmm. um, what I hope to see, though, is if we can expand on what we have here and, and improve what we have here. Um, but I can't, I can't complain, honestly. I mean, mm -hmm. I was surprised to move so quickly from the old location to this location. And so I didn't see that mm -hmm. coming. And I was really pleasantly surprised that we were able to do that. So, okay. so yeah, so I don't see that. I don't know. I wish, but <laughs> it's a lot of money. The Black Cultural Center, I heard, would cost double than what it cost them to build now, mm -hmm. especially because of the location. Right. So, yeah. One thing I didn't bring up was the, um, was it the Latino Conference. Oh, the Indiana Latino the Leadership Indiana. Conference. Yeah, yeah we, um, the Indiana Latino Leadership Conference was actually, has been a conference that has, started by Indiana University at Bloomington. They've had the conference for eight years. This year, the ninth annual, we hosted it. It was the first time it was hosted off the Bloomington campus. And the way that came about was because we were taking students from Jefferson High School and our students to the conference every year. And um, you know, on those bus rides, those two hour bus rides, there's a lot of conversation and the students were like, why doesn't Purdue do something? We'd love to see Purdue. So actually the Jeff High School students were the ones asking for Purdue to do some kind of conference mm -hmm. that would really give them a better idea of what Purdue has to offer. And since it's in the, their backyard, why not? And so we were looking at doing our own conference and maybe more of a local conference. And I thought, well, you know, I don't want to compete with um, IU's conference and we had been so supportive over the years in terms of taking participants and so I called them and said this is what our students are thinking is there any way that we could maybe you know have the conference sort of taken off the Purdue or the Bloomington campus and move to the Purdue campus for one year mm -hmm. and we can look at rotating campuses since that's one, that was one of the things that came out of the evaluations for that conference is that students were only seeing the Bloomington campus there were a ton of other students from across the state there, mm -hmm. uh, college students included, and so they really wanted to look at other campuses and experience other campuses. And so um, those talks began and um, we formed a student committee. And so the student committee uh, really took the lead. And so our students actually, our embajadores did a lot of the planning for the statewide conference. We doubled the participation uh, and we could have easily gone up, you know, we went to 450 registrations. We could have easily surpassed 500. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, whereas they had 250 something, 260 the year prior. Mm -hmm. And so, and that was their max. And so we were just astonished that we were able to do that. But we think also location had a lot, had a lot to do with it. We attracted different students than mm -hmm. Bloomington had ever attracted. And location, I think, had part of it. 
Um, we had a lot of support from the provost office to, to help us get the word out in terms of financially and, mm -hmm. and, and being able to get those resources. And so uh, we, it was a huge success. And I wish the media would have covered it a little bit more, but it was definitely it was definitely a good, really good experience for our students. And mm -hmm. next year it's going to be at IUPUI for the 10th anniversary, which is very fitting because it's Indiana University, Purdue University in Indianapolis. And yeah. um, it's, I think it's very fitting for, for the 10th anniversary and it shows that it's moving forward. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so that was, that was a great thing to have for one year. And <laughs> I'm glad it was only one year. <laughs> so, so we might do something like that in the future, but not um, maybe not in that scope. It, it would probably be more of a local conference. We are doing a camp. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we're doing this summer for the first time is we're doing a, a short, small summer camp with some Valparais Valparaiso High School students that are rising seniors. And it's an academy, it's sort of a leadership academy that we're gonna, going to focus again on, uh, you know, sort of what can they do to be effective in their senior year mm -hmm. in terms of going to college and then once they're in college what should they be doing as well and so we'll mm -hmm. have a three-day camp we'll employ about six student mentors from um, Purdue to help us with those students and um, again it's one of those things that we're just doing it mm -hmm. we're not doing it to recruit for Purdue we're just doing it in terms of, of focusing on um, Latino student re you know recruitment to any college and retention mm -hmm. in college as well because retention is low we are for, for Purdue University, retention's at 60% at a six-year rate, which has stayed pretty steady, mm -hmm. and um, compared to the general population at 75%. And so we can do a much better job in terms of retaining students, I think, and we have a lot of, we have a lot of work to do, but I hope that little by little we're able to do that. Yeah. So. Well, that camp is taking place here on campus? It is. It's taking place here. We'll have them housed in Tarkington, just a couple blocks away. Um, they'll sort of be doing the L, they'll be dining at Ford and going to Armstrong and Beering and um, mm. so they will have, you know, two nights here. It's pretty quick, quick uh, leadership academy, but I think it'll be a nice way for us to kind of test the waters in terms of doing those types of things on a more academic level and we're, we'll have 44 students, 22 female, 22 male mm -hmm. from the Valpo Lake County area. Okay. And so, yeah, so we're we're excited but nervous at the same time because it is our first camp. And when, are, when is it taking place? July 22nd through the 24th. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So we're excited about that. Mm -hmm. so. Well, is there anything else that no. you would like I to feel like there about? is, but I, don't, I can't think of <laughs> I can't think of anything off the I'm sure as soon as you leave I'll think of something. But I can't think of anything right now. Anything mm -hmm. memorable that you wanted to share or something? Memorable. Um, I've learned a lot, I guess. I, I mean, I've learned a lot from the students and from the faculty staff and even from my staff here at the LCC, we've grown from just Jesse and I to now we have two, three full-time staff members, including myself. We have a program coordinator, a business operations specialist, and myself. And then we have a, a graduate assistant position that's a permanent position, which is great and and then now we have anywhere from five to seven work study staff on a regular basis a part-time web graphics coordinator mm -hmm. um, and we even have a quarter-time development person you know to help us raise money and so that's you know miles beyond where we started and so mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm amazed at what we've been able to accomplish but I certainly couldn't have done it without the support and and uh, wonderful you know volunteerism that our students have that I'm always amazed that they do because I just I remember being a student and volunteering was not an option <laughs> my time had to be paid and so I, I'm just always amazed that that they're able to do so much and so I I think that I've grown even you know through watching them and and, and better understanding them I understand myself as well so I've learned a lot definitely I think of any experience in particular. <laughs> Humanigration is probably the most powerful thing that I've done since, you know, in terms of learning. I didn't think I would get emotional on that trip, and that was something that um, I thought I knew so much about immigration, and, you know, but it's much different when you read about it and then you see it up front and personal. So the Humanigration was definitely 
um, really heavy and it was hard to do, but it was worth it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I don't know if I'll go next year, but. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it continues. Yeah, it will continue. It just, I don't know if I'll go every year. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Well, thank you. Yeah, no yeah. problem. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing this. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see. So.